So, Stacy. Eric. We're getting to this place now where you watch the news and all you need to do is hear the name of a city and it just is depressing. I can't as watch hell. the news. I can't. I can't. Yeah. I can't. So, I can't. Charlottesville. Stop. Puerto Rico. Stop. Las Vegas. Stop. It's, just, it's bad. And, you know, it's, and we were both talking about this before. Mm hmm. Sometimes doing a show all about movies and TV and pop songs sounds and very, very shallow, really shallow. <laughs> and it and and I have a hard time rationalizing it sometimes. Yeah, although, but but I always come back to here's what I come back to: mm-hmm. do not let the bastards get you down. Right? We have to have some fun in this life, yes. right? You're like we need I, to keep the things that make us happy. And I think that's that that is one thing, and we've talked about this before, and mm-hmm. that that's one reason that. I that that we decided to do this. Yeah. Is that we both liked talking about this, but also one reason we like talking about these things is it's a little bit of an escape. Yeah. From whatever is out there. Yeah. And I guess my hope amongst all of the everything that happens just on a daily, weekly basis right now. Yep. Whether it is Man made or Mother Nature, whatever it is that's that's going on. There's some idiot with a Twitter account, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> My hope is that that's what we are a little bit of an escape from that. Yeah. And, you know, in years from now, pop culture will have been shaded, if not colored, by what's going on right now. I'm Again, sure. whether it is natural or man made. You know, and, and and maybe we'll still be around talking about it, yeah. and be able to. So let's let's figure that. out which Disney child star of today is going to play Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> it's too soon. All right, welcome to Pop Reason, everybody. When the chaos of popular culture makes your brain hurt, you really need belief in the form of a transfusion of analysis and humor. It's time for a poperation. Join hosts Eric and Stacy as they dissect popular culture one bloody organ at a time. It's just what the doctor ordered. So, this is Poperation. I'm Stacy. I'm Eric, and this week we are talking about funny girls. We had a show a little while ago where we wanted to talk about stand-up comedy. It's such a huge topic. We're not going to even cover it in two episodes. Well, we'll part come one. back. To this, but one of the interesting things that Stacy and I found is that when we were thinking about who our favorite comedians were, about half of them were women, um, mm-hmm. and and there's a lot of talk about how women are kind of underrepresented in the worlds of comedy. That like you know most comics are men, and yet I think there's something about us that we're really drawn to women who are funny. So the gender split seemed to be a really convenient place for us to say, well, in these first two, let's do one about guys uh, and one about. About girls. And this is, this is, you know, funny girls part one. I, you know, the thing about it, uh, about underrepresented and that sort of thing, the stand up, especially the stand up comedian world, mm-hmm. the comic world, was always male centric, but it, and it was a hard life. Yeah. And the guys were rough, you know, mm-hmm. off, off stage. And it was, it was just a hard life. And so a lot of women just didn't want to do it. I mean, yep. you just didn't, you couldn't, it, it was so taxing yep. psychologically. And then, you know, and, and that's mm-hmm. including the misogyny, but just the whole concept of it. Yeah. Well, and being heckled and that whole kind All of thing, it's just like, you know, it was, it was tough to be a woman and give it back as good as you got. Right. And that's kind of what heckling was all kind of meant to do. It's hard to do that as a, as a female comic and still be likable and, at the end after like abusing your audience. Right. And accept it. And I mm-hmm. think. So, you know, when you look back you at the 40s and 50s when some of this, you know, the, the again, there was radio and there was television and mm-hmm. there were record albums. And, yep. and so you have a lot of men that you can look back historically who, who were major legends and icons. Women, it's a little sparser. Yeah. And I, I want to, you know, the ones we were talking about, it came to mind. Yeah. Um, Phyllis Diller. Yes. Hilarious. And then after her, Joan Rivers, who gave Phyllis Diller a lot of credit. Yes. Because Phyllis, you talk about dealing with, I mean, she was dealing with Bob Hope. She was mm-hmm. dealing with all those guys of that ilk. Yeah. And competing with them. And, but what she did, I mean, I mean, I guess there's George and Gracie Burns. Yeah. I guess Gracie Burns. I mean, she's brilliant. 
but she never was out on her own and she really did play a character. Yes. And she, she was, he was the fun, you know, she would, she was funny because but she, she didn't was know stupid. she was funny. I yeah. mean, you know what it was? He Tracy's was this, character yeah. didn't know she was funny. George knew he was funny. So I don't know that she really opened door. I mean, I guess yeah. to an extent she did. She sure. got women working, mm-hmm. but at the same time, Phyllis Diller was out there on her own. Yep. Yeah. She did create a character. Yes. Whereas Joan Rivers was Joan Rivers. And who knows how much of a persona comes out. I mean, I'm sure Joan Rivers had a softer side at some moments of her life. But when she was on stage. Well, she wasn't always hard on stage, no. I don't think. I mean, well, you know, she she was, but they were pulling stuff from their own lives. Yes, yes. I mean, she saying, was a, that was certainly a facet of Joan. You know what, about Gracie and George Byrne, it was kind of like uh, Abbott and Costello. Mm-hmm. It was a setup and a punchline. Yeah. And that's kind of, they did jokes. Yeah. Whereas Phyllis Diller was pulling funny. I mean, there were jokes. Don't get mm-hmm. me wrong. It's but up, but up, but up. But there was, she was pulling from her. She was writing her stuff from her own life. Yes. And so that was a new thing. Mm-hmm. And now uh, granted hers was, she had to filter it because yep. of the time in order to get on Carson in order to get in those movies and Bob Hope, you know, she had to do s- a certain kind of comedy uh-huh. and Joan Rivers in the beginning did the same thing. And then she and then she got more, you know, more clout and more yeah. famous and was able to do exactly what she wanted. Mm-hmm. And they both, though, opened the doors. There's so many great female stand up comedians. There yeah. are also some bad ones, by the way, <laughs> yeah, like everything, like sure. everything. Um, but oh but my it seems gosh. to me, you know, there's stand up. And then it seems to me like, you know, for the last I don't know, it's 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 not, this is not a recent thing. This has been going on for a while. Um, But the other place that we tend to find women in comedy, well, people in comedy, they either go the stand up route or they go the improv comedy. Correct. That's true. So like the groundlings or Second City. And that's where a lot of, you know, uh, Saturday Night Live, you know, pulls from stuff like that. So like Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, have they ever done stand up? I don't know. That that we, they I have. don't know. But they they did improv. That was where they kind yes. of started. They would walk on a stage and they would kind of get. You know, suggestions from the audience and they would just start building a scene right there. Um, I was part of an improv comedy troupe in college. It's not easy. Um, Takes a lot of concentration, takes a lot of teamwork. And in that vein, I think that's where, you know, that's probably an easier starting ground for a woman in comedy is to go out there and do improv. Well, Um, it's usually a group activity yes. first of all yeah. so you are within this you know there's a group of you male and mm-hmm. female and you're popping off of each other yes. so that's helpful that yeah. it's not just you and mm-hmm. we talked about this that the whole idea of going on stage in front of this audience with a microphone all by yourself there's no music there's i mean it's just you yep. is to me it's horrifying <laughs> and you know without a you know it, it, without a character not hiding behind a character mm-hmm. you're putting yourself out yeah. there that is uh, absolutely petrifying yeah yeah and but there is there there is uh you know an adrenaline shot uh-huh. you know there that you get out of it when it when it goes well obviously yep. but i think that again it's one of those where there were women and i think phyllis diller and joan rivers really pushed that door open Mm -hmm. so that more women felt like that. And it's what's funny. You go on Netflix and put in female stand-ups and you will get just a ton of them. I think the technical term is a shit ton. It is really a shit ton. And and I'm going to underline the word shit. (laughs) And the reason is because some of them are so crap. And and this is also when you put in male stand-up. Okay. I don't mean to say that it's just the women. No. Yes. But it was really interesting because I, you know, I was, I'm rooting for the women. Mm -hmm. to be funny. And I was like, let me see if there's somebody new or whatever that I've never heard of. And I'll, there was one woman, she, it didn't say, I mean, it had her name and it had the name of her, uh, comedy special and it's all in English. Uh So I, I click on it and she starts talking in English and I'm okay. She's, uh, at ethnic, culture. I'm not going to say which, because I don't want any, I I don't want anyone to be insulted by this. (laughs) <laughs> so she starts talking and she tells half the joke in English and half the joke in her native tongue, which, by the way, I don't know. Hmm. But her audience clearly does. OK, so it's not that it was you know the first half, the second. It was like 
she'd say three words in English and then a couple of words in her language. And then she'd finish it off in English and she'd make a look and then she'd pause for laughter. Clearly that's the end of the joke. Okay. Stacy didn't get any of them. Well, was her audience laughing? Her audience was sort of. Okay. Well, but she wasn't, the English stuff I heard wasn't funny. All right. Let me just throw that out. Fair. Um, And then there was another one that, that I did, I didn't care for at all, but it was just, again, that's, I did that on the men's side too, but I had not the whole language thing. Of going back and forth, yeah. and I hadn't been warned. Yeah, that ticked me off. Well, had you ever uh, heard of this? Is this is someone who didn't you know who's not going to be talked about in depth uh, in the show? But have you ever heard of this very famous routine by a, a comic named Tig Nataro? I know her. Yeah. Okay, you know of her. Mm-hmm. Have you heard like the routine? That I don't she's know if I've really seen the routine. I've seen some of her stuff. But okay, I seen well, the. the routine that she's really well known for. If you and I think it's available on iTunes. You and doesn't listen to it. But also, doesn't she have a show coming on Amazon? She that, does. Yes, she does. Yeah, she's uh, a and this kind of made her. Um, Louis C.K. was hosting this comedy special, so you hear him introduce her, mm-hmm. and she comes out and she's like, "Hey, um, found out today I had cancer." And that's the beginning of her show. And she did find out just that morning that she had a very aggressive form of cancer. And people chuckle. And she's like, yeah, that wasn't the joke. No, I have cancer. And I found this out today. And she goes into 25 minutes of stand-up that is some of the most hysterically funny stuff I've ever heard in my entire life. But it's like this real thing Mm -hmm. and she didn't she's like i couldn't do the set i'd planned on doing there's just no way i could have done that um but being as as gifted as she is she's good at what and her job is to find humor in the everyday or, or or otherwise and she found humor in all this stuff and so her thing about the waiting room her thing about you know the doctor it's like you know trying to soften the blow it's like this is not a blow you soften you know and it's all of the it's so great Mm -hmm. um and I think, you know, I, not to, to leap forward too much, but I think that that is something about women in comedy that I think is different than I see with a lot of men in comedy is that a lot of times, whether it's a whether it's a kind of a monologist, one woman show type of thing, mm-hmm. or even just a, a very traditional stand up, oftentimes they touch upon really personal stories in ways that guys tend not to, but are still very, 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 very funny. And And something about the person in me who likes movies and theater and tv and stories in general i get really drawn to that i think that's one of the reasons why i get you know very i I have an affinity for a lot of female comics who tell these stories in a very funny way and i agree completely i think that that is one of the differences is that uh especially early on for men it was jokes about other people or about Mm -hmm. their wives or whatever whereas women are going into their lives about my life yeah this is what happened to me this is how i reacted to this and so there's a different kind of personalization yeah. to it. Now, men do that a lot now, too. So, again, that's evolved. Mm-hmm. Both, both stand-ups have evolved to, yeah. to a certain degree. But I think that women started there more. Yeah. And, like, interestingly, you know, so the, the heir to Joan Rivers in a lot of ways was probably Kathy Griffin. Yes. You know, did a lot of, here, let's talk about this celebrity and let's trash talk them. Let's talk about this celebrity and kind of trash talk them. A little bit of insult comic yes. stuff around celebrities. Now, interestingly, she's touring the world. She's starting in Australia. Mm-hmm. Her new special is called Laugh Your Head Off. And so, and you know, if you know popular culture, oh, if you've been living current, under a rock, let me yeah. tell you what happened. So, yeah. so Kathy Griffin um, posed for a picture with a mask that looked like Trump, and you could only tell it was Trump because of the hairstyle. Yep, just this severed head with Trump's hair covered with ketchup, and it mm-hmm. looked like she had just chopped his head off and was kind of holding it aloft, kind of in a Roman emperor kind of thing. Wearing uh, a, a blouse, by the way, that goes by the name Pussy Bow. Ah. So she was wearing a Pussy Bow okay. while she was holding Trump's head aloft. Well, it was a huge controversy. Um, conservatives said she's evil. There's a Secret Service investigation. Liberals piled on yep. her and said, this is inappropriate. We are better than this. What happened to Michelle Obama? When they go low, we go high. Right. Blah, 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 blah. So I was kind of on the fence about that whole thing when it came out. I was like, look, I don't really like this picture, but I'm not prepared to say, like, she's a comic. You know, it's just like, I don't, I don't, it wasn't particularly funny to me. Right. I didn't get the joke, but I wasn't about to, you know, I I wasn't part, I wasn't a huge pile on. A lot of my friends got really mad at me, like, this is wrong. And one of them was down in Georgia trying to campaign for um, a Democrat who was Mm -hmm. running in a special election because Trump had made an appointment. 
And he said, we lost that election because of Kathy Griffin. I'm like, uh, okay. I, I don't I mean, maybe. I don't know. It was right then. It was right at the moment. And they were like, liberals are evil. And it kind of cemented something in people's minds. My point being is that I bet if you see this tour, the Laugh Your Head Off tour, it's probably going to be framed as a big story about, let me tell you about all the shit I went through being part of a national firestorm. Oh, I'm sure and it I is. I wonder if her comedy is going to change as a result of this. And she's going to start doing something that's a little bit more story formatted as opposed to, you know, Incident. Kim and Kanye, yeah. blah, 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 you know, Taylor Swift, um, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's an interesting, and, that, and that's, that was, um, you know, somebody brought up the idea of, you know, had it been a man who had done it. I, I don't know. I feel like maybe the blowback would have been either way, honestly, maybe. because of the timing, because yeah. timing is everything. Yeah. And so it's th- that was that is that is a weird controversial one. I I you know I'm I'm kind of as far as no I didn't think it was funny, but at the same time I live in America where you know freedom of speech mm-hmm. still out there, and so whatever. I yeah. I think um, you know it was deemed to be a threat, so the Secret Service apparently did investigate, which right. I guess they do, and this is something that happened to. You know, Ted Nugent, when Ted Nugent said some shit about Barack yeah. Obama, same kind of thing happened. And I'm like, fine, do your investigation, whatever. Yeah. Of course, the investigation's now over. They decided that Kathy Griffin actually was not plotting no. against Donald Trump's life. Spoiler. Um, well, okay. I think, you know, I think that what I think I told you that I was watching the the CNN documentary about comedy, the history of comedy. Uh-huh. And in a lot of times, and especially when they're talking about Lenny Bruce and that sort of and George Carlin and that sort of thing, they were yep. talking about stand up is risk. You have to risk something. You know, it's like mm-hmm. no pain, no gain. Yep. And so a lot of times comedians will take these risks and sometimes they pay off and we laugh hysterically and we say, awesome, that was great. But we don't necessarily necessarily think of the risk. But when they take the risk and it doesn't pay off, it comes back at them like this. We then go, that was a risk. But they're taking risks all the time. Yes. And we only really think about, oh, well, should they be doing that when it misfires? Mm-hmm. But I think that, you know, where she is, Kathy is now, just to quick on this is that she's getting past that and going, I mean, if you're going to have this career, Mm -hmm. then either if you're not going to be willing to take some of those risks and go out there, a, you're never going to be great, but also you probably shouldn't be in the Mm -mm. thing. So I think that, you know, those who, uh, you know, the regular people, whatever your feeling on it was, was, you know, it's like me, I'm not going to be a stand up comedian. And one reason is, that was a choice that she had to make, whether she was going to do that or not. Mm-hmm. And I'll be honest, I probably wouldn't have done it. But it's not because I'm a better person. It's because that is a risk. Even if, you know, even if it had worked, it's one of those where I probably would have been on the conservative side and said, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just I tend to err on the side mm-hmm. of mm, maybe not. Well, and, and I think and so. I think me, it's again, it yeah. comes down to the personality that stand up comedians have yeah. that normal people don't. Yeah. Now, if I were a stand up comic, which people have, we said this the last time we talked about the guys, people have told us both on numerous yeah, occasions you should do stand up. Yeah, stop it. Um, <laughs> if that were me, I would talk politics. It's a huge part of what I think about the world. If you check out my Facebook feed, half of it is, you know, oh my God, can you believe this? This happened. Holy shit. Da, da, da. I, I live in Washington, D.C., so it's part of the air I breathe. I would joke about politics, and you would find out pretty clearly, pretty soon, what my politics were. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, it would be like I would do that stuff if I could find the humor in it. To me, it was like, okay, you want me to hold up a severed head of Donald Trump? Where's the joke? Yes, yeah, so like you know, it's not funny joke, to me. Yeah, yeah if, exactly. If there had been a joke there, mm-hmm. and if there was something, even if it were teetering on the edge of is this kind mm-hmm. of over – the line of good taste, but it's also really funny. Mm-hmm. Would I go there? I, I would have to make that decision. Would I have done exactly what she did? No, because I would have just said, I don't get the joke, you know, and, you and, know, and that's my, my problem is I feel like on that particular choice, the majority it's, it's again, and I've said this before, know your audience. 
and the majority of people aren't going to get that joke. Yeah. That was my feeling. And clearly, clearly what happened, majority of people didn't get well, the I joke. Well, I still don't get the joke. I mean, no, oh, no I one's really explained it to me in yeah. a way to say, oh, it's funny because of this. Yeah, I don't know why. Um, yeah. I don't it know didn't. Funny. So, so uh, yeah. But, you know, but that's that's what you do as a stand-up. Right. You know, and, and when you talk about that risk, you know, when you are there, it is the most primitive form of entertainment. Correct. It is you talking to people with absolutely no barrier between you and them. And the, the, the contract, the invisible contract is, you're going to make me laugh, which so, is a tall order. So here I have a question then for you. Though. Yeah. So I'm going to say this. There are a lot of male comedians out there, comics, mm-hmm. successful, yep. that to me are average or even below average of the handsome side. Okay. I'm trying to figure out of a successful female comedian who was not aside from phyllis diller okay who was not attractive well and again that's in the eye of the beholder sure but i feel like that that is a standard that is held up to to female uh-huh. comics more so than well, guys i think there are okay so so attractive means a couple things one there's just you know how attractive a person is total eye of the beholder your yeah opinion. There's also this other thing that women, I think, in entertainment deal with was in terms of what's your size, what's your dress size, you know, how big are yeah. you? Now, there are some big girls yeah, there who are. do comedy, and they're very funny, you know. So I think on that note, you can be who you want to be. Right. Um, I do kind of think, you know, when I, I saw Joan Rivers live, yeah. when she was in her early 70s, okay. I think. Um, it was probably about 10 years ago. Right. But she kept um, having work done. But that's and you it. have to say, why did she keep having work well, done? Well, that's it. So so, so I watched her, and I thought, she's had a shit ton of plastic surgery. Mm-hmm. And that was obvious. And it was the first thing I saw when I saw her. I didn't say, oh, she's beautiful. I thought, she's had a ton of plastic surgery. But she had a ton of energy as well. And after the show is over, I would say, okay, she maybe looks fake, but she doesn't look 72. Okay. You know, okay. so which so is what yes, she wanted. Get, yes, she didn't care if she looked fake. She knew that if she looked seventy-two, right, young gay men like me, younger <laughs> gay men like me, gay men of a significantly younger generation would not necessarily buy tickets to see her. But she made no pretense of right. not having work done. Correct. You know, and she wasn't even going for the Jane Fonda. Jane Fonda, by the way, gave the best advice when it came to plastic surgery. She says, and Jane Fonda looks amazing she really does she says here's the secret go to your doctor and don't say i want to look 20 you say i want to look 20 years younger than i am so if you're 70 go for 50 right if you're in your 80s go for 60 that's what you should you know and that's and it makes you look like you're you're healthy and you're you know i wonder if that's what michelle pfeiffer did she doesn't look bad. You know, I saw her in the... No, the, she looks... She looks... But, she I mean, looks she, she looks good, but she looks like she's aging, as yes. opposed to those who are trying to not look like they're aging. And who look completely plastic. And I which feel Joan like... Rivers kind of did. You she know? did at the end because she kept doing it. Yeah. She didn't yeah. stop. You know, and so... But and, when she started, when she was on Carson at the beginning, uh-huh. she was attractive. Okay. She was... Yeah. Just, she was very... She was pretty. Yeah. I don't know that she thought she was. I think she was always insecure about it. Yeah. But she was, I thought she was. So I agree. So I wonder if that's an extra thing. I agree. And I think at the time she also looked, I don't know how, I I hope people aren't offended by this. I'm not, I don't mean this in an offensive way. She was very obviously Jewish. She was a Jewish. Well, and she was, but she was very much proud. I mean, that was part of her. Barbara Streisand, right, was not considered a great beauty of her time because there were some features there that you kind of looked at her. And the first thing you saw was, okay, that's a nice looking Jewish girl. Um, now I think there's less kind of, I will tell you this. So we were watching funny girl. It was Uh on, we weren't watching the whole thing, but we watched one part and and it's one of her solos where she's singing out on the street and my daughter who hasn't seen it. We haven't watched a lot of, no, you know what we watched? We watched, um, what's up doc, but we were watching this one and she, so my daughter had seen what's up doc Mm -hmm. and with Barbara Streisand and we're watching this. And so Barbara Streisand's, and for me, I'm, and, and I'm sitting there and of course her hair is back in that sixties thing when, mm-hmm. you know, we've talked about that. And, and all Isabella said was she is so pretty. Yeah. There was no for a uh, Jewish mm-hmm. person no. or, but, or, or anything. There was nothing. Nose, yeah. Correct. There was nothing like that. And it was just, I just, Kind of said, I said, yeah, she really, she really was. And she still is, but she yeah. really was. And that, she was gorgeous. But it's just, you're exactly right. In this time, it's not, people don't yeah. necessarily pull so out she that was stuff not, anymore. You know, but you, at the time, they were doing so that. When Marilyn Monroe was the standard of beauty, Correct. you know, Joe Rivers didn't knows. really match yeah. that. 
But you look at her now with 2017 eyes as yeah. a young woman, you're like, she was really pretty. She was you really know? pretty. The same way I look at myself as a 20-year-old and go, God, I was skinny. I've never felt skinny in my entire life. But I apparently I Correct. was at one point in my life, at least more. Well, that also talks now. to you know every our society and yeah. your self-esteem. Yeah, so, yeah. but yeah, that's how that goes. But anyway, that's but I feel like they have that they have to deal with as well. Whereas guys, I don't attention. think have to do that as much. They have to pay attention to what they look like much more than than men do. But, you know, I saw a, a woman, uh, Netflix is the stand-ups. We've talked about that, you know, the last time. Yes. Um, did you see Fortune Feimster on? Yes, I did. Big She's a big girl. She's a tall, comic. big girl, and, too. Yeah, and she, and but she plays that. I mean, you know, that that's who she, she is. She acknowledges the it. The gift yeah. about stand-up is that, you know, the, the downside is that you yourself and you don't have any barriers. Right. The upside is that you're, you're yourself. yourself. And so you don't have to wait for someone to cast you as blankety blank. Right. Fortune Feimster is, I, she's on a show, actually. She's, I just saw a, a preview of something, some show that she's on. Um, she is, and I've forgotten it I, now that you yeah. just said what it is, what, that she's on there. Because <laughs> I remember they, it, um, yes, she is. But she's on, she's on something, you know, but you don't have, as a stand-up comedian, you go out there and you're you. You don't have to, you know, meet someone's type of the girl right. or the, you know, uh, you know, the, the hot girl next door in the Big Bang Theory or whatever. No, I think that now, you know, it is it's a better environment for all types. But I do think that they there is that but consideration. But it's something that takes consideration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so, you know, there you go. We're going to do. It's girls versus boys. So we're here today to talk about funny girls. We are going to talk about funny girls. So one of my favorite, favorite, favorite uh, funny women, uh, actually, it's kind of what we talked about before. It did not come from the world of stand-up came from the world of improv, um, was a big player in L.A.'s The Groundlings and then got picked up by Saturday Night Live, uh, where she was mostly famous for playing Pat, the super yes. androgynous, most androgynous person you've ever seen in your entire life. Um, you know, interestingly, Pat was just mentioned a while back I was gonna say, by didn't that Jill just, Soloway, who this is came the, up. the showrunner of Transparent, who said, yeah. who's the most transphobic thing you've ever seen? Oh, Pat. And that's so funny because every trans person I know in my life, like just anecdotally, but yep. all of my trans friends, they love Pat. And the thing about Pat is that if you don't know anything about It's Pat, which was the name of this mm -hmm. sketch, Pat was super androgynous, obviously androgynous name, and no one could tell whether Pat was male or female. And, and so they, they would had... pepper Pat with questions that tried to get to, because of course you'd never ask, excuse me, are you male or female? Well, didn't they have a boyfriend or girlfriend named Terry? Chris. Chris. Where and did then Terry? Chris's ex was Terry. Terry. Okay, I so knew. So they kept on going, yeah, yes. with this whole. So, and obviously it's like, okay, so if you prove that Chris is male, Pat could be a gay guy. I mean, like, I didn't even think about that because we were like back in this very gender yes. kind of, anyway, you would never obviously ask Pat, hey, are you male or female? Because what Pat was really making fun of is this whole idea that if you're not obviously male, you're doing masculinity wrong. And if you're not obviously female, you're doing femininity right. wrong. A lot of social commentary all wrapped right. up in Pat. But the great thing was is that people would ask Pat all these questions that were meant to elicit the answer was going to tell you what gender Pat was. And you never knew whether Pat was totally in on the joke or completely oblivious. It was probably the latter. But Pat always gave these middle-of-the-road answers that did not answer right. the question. It's very frustrating. And what was very funny is that Pat wasn't frustrated. No, all. no, no. And for Pat to the audience. was totally fine mm -hmm. with Pat, whatever Pat was. And maybe Pat, what we know now about gender binary is that, you know, maybe Pat <laughs> identified right in the middle and didn't identify as one or the other and was probably very happy in that place. Um, and the fact that no one knew how to treat Pat probably made Pat really ecstatic. But people around Pat were being driven nuts. And it was all about how seriously we take gender and so there's a lot of stuff going on with Pat but also just hysterically funny right. very very great writing but her performance as Pat was really kind of fun and and in her um one of her very first one woman shows Julia Sweeney Julia Sweeney did we not mention her nope, name we had never said her name, said her name. we do that a lot okay uh, Julia Sweeney was her name and she 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 did Pat one of the very first uh one woman shows she ever did was called God Said Ha and it's about her brothers dealing with uh, stage four terminal cancer, while at the same time she had ovarian uh, uterine cancer. She had cancer of the uterus. And so both of them were dealing with cancer at the same time. Not a lot of material you'd think right for comedy, but her parents from Spokane, Washington, came down to L.A., and they all lived in the same house together. And that was the source <laughs> of all the comedy. It was like being a 30-year-old woman and your mom driving you 
freaking crazy, mm-hmm. but they're there because their kids have cancer, and what are you going to do? Now, she, you were talking about, it was kind of the same Tina Fey, Amy Poehler ilk yep. in that it wasn't, she, she doesn't do stand-up per se. No. It's more of a one-woman show, yeah. kind of a monologue yeah. sort of Yeah, when she does a show, it's just her on stage, mm-hmm. and she is talking about her life. These no, are true stories. Right. So she is her. The difference is there's usually a set. There's usually a okay. couch and a vase of flowers and a bookshelf. She's very well read. I mean, if you're a fan of Julia Sweeney, you realize this woman reads like the rest of us breathe. I mean, it's just she's read everything. Um, and she kind of sets up the place so it looks like her living room. And there are light cues and there are music cues. It's staged. And there are sound. Yes, it's I mean, a little like, there's bit more. staging, as they there's say. There's more stagecraft it... in what she's doing. Right. She doesn't usually hold a mic. So usually the stage is mic'd and she can walk right. anywhere. And you can tell she's blocked things out a little bit. But at this point, I'm going to sit on the couch. I'm going to tell the story here. And then I'm going to stand up and I'm going to get into the front of the audience. And do, you know, it's it's there's been a there's a directing mm-hmm. hand in what's going on. And yet she's just standing there telling stories about a, her life. And it's very, very, very funny. Right. Um, so God Said Ha was one in the family way was her next one, all about her adopting her daughter uh, from China um, and just the cross cultural thing and also being a new mom and just being a, a woman who's decided that she wants kids, you know, and just coming to that realization, um, going down to, uh, she had to, she had to sign some legal papers and it was an all day ordeal. Um, and it was supposed to be this big, beautiful moment for her. And the guy behind the counter is just reading pornography just in front of her. And she's like, you can't do that Not during my special moment. You know, <laughs> it's just all of this kind of stuff. The show that I fell in love with her for is a, is a piece called letting go of God. When she talk about risk, you know, she, she basically put a big target on her back mm-hmm. for a lot of people in this country who do not want to hear this message at all. But it's her story, and it's a personal story. She right. is not anti-religious. But personally, she had a life that took her from Catholic schoolgirl to lapsed Catholic uh-huh. to re-engaged Catholic, and she got a little bit too into it. I think she saw how the sausage was made, asked too many questions, and realized, I, I, I can't accept mm-hmm. a lot of this stuff. Then she went religious sh- religion shopping for a while, okay. just in terms of how she wanted it. So maybe God is nature, or maybe maybe we all worship the same God just in different ways. And maybe I'll just be kind of I won't I won't go to organized religion, but I'll still have this. And then finally, she started getting interested in science and just realized that her belief system is really this natural world we live in. One of the things she says is that you know this is the first knowledge quest I went on that I didn't learn too much and it ruined it. Um, you know, and right. now she just kind of she exists as someone who just doesn't you know she believes in the natural world. She believes that when we die, the lights go out, um, and that's and that's who she is. The reason that I admire her so much for doing this is a from a comedian standpoint, very 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 funny. Like you, okay. you wouldn't sense a whole lot of comedy in what I just kind of no, told you. No, not really. But but you've seen a clip of this. You I know? have. So so she yeah, tells her this. stories in a very very funny way. She's very funny. Um, she's yeah. a, and she's a very she's very likable. Yes. On stage yeah. screen, and she's not telling you to be an atheist. She's not saying you should give it. She's saying for me. This is my point of view. This is how it works. Well, and for I me. think that that's what ca- comedians, you know, the idea is this is what I, this is who I am. This is a story about me. This is a part of my life. This is what is a, I have observed. Most of the time, it's not this is what you should agree with. Yeah. And I think that's why she's still in the category, as opposed yeah. to being actress who does yeah. one woman shows. She's writing her own stuff and it, and, and she's finding the funny. Yeah. And in all, all of it. But but as someone who kind of was on the same, just a little bit about me personally, kind of on the same track, grew up in a Catholic household now, you know, and like her, I don't I'm not fond of the word atheist because that kind of defines me based on what I'm not as opposed to what I actually believe in. But if that's the word you want to use, that's accurate. Fine. But she's not an asshole the way that a lot of people who write, quote unquote, atheist literature are just <laughs> assholes. I mean, Richard Dawkins is a dick. Sam Harris is just he's a, he's a douchebag. I mean, these people are awful, you know, <laughs> and the way that they just attack people who do have any kind of faith in mm-hmm. something above ourselves, you know, some kind of, you know, I'll, I'll call it supernatural, mm-hmm. you know, out there. And they just treat them like idiots. And they're just they're jerks. And, you know, and she's the person that I could look to and say, yeah. I'm like that. So it was also nice to kind of see myself up there in a lot of ways and just kind of hear my story sent back to me in a way that I could totally relate to. And I don't feel like a jerk for 
just basically looking at the Catholic Church and saying, that's all great, and if it works for you, that's awesome, but it's just not for me. Okay, here's my thing. You have liked her, though, for a really long time. Yeah. Before that. Yes. So what did you connect to her to early on that made you such a fan? Because this is, as I said, you've liked her forever. Yeah. I really, I, I really. Have so, what was it about her? What, what funny was she pulling that connected to you? Well, I think with God said hot, it was the the piece around you know this is a show built around cancer, right? And so she and her brother would answer the phone and say, "Hello, Sweeney's House of Cancer," <laughs> you know, and they were just talking about the morbid things you do to get through certain parts of life. Spoiler alert: a little bit in this first show, she talks about the fact that her brother does die, mm-hmm. and he was really far along when he was diagnosed, and so that's one of the reasons why you know when her parents came down. She wasn't even diagnosed yet. It was all about her brother, Mike. Um, When her brother dies in the show, the lights go down a little bit. She talks about it very quietly. There are no jokes, really. Mm -hmm. Um, It becomes a really, you know, very moving kind of moment where she remembers him. And then she (laughs) she describes a friend of hers saying, we need to, to, you know, what we need to do is we need to do some kind of therapy with you where we give you something that's even more like, you know, I don't know where he came up with this idea. He thought it would be a great thing for her to do at that moment to go watch the bridges of Madison County. I don't know when that would ever be a good idea. <laughs> so she's sitting in, the, I, I'm so sitting she here. describes herself in line to see the bridges of Madison County. She's already sobbing. Like she's in tears in line while everyone's looking around going, um, we're going to see the movie so we can sob. And she describes the moment where everyone in the movie theater started crying and she stopped. And it did for whatever reason, like her friend had something on the money. She was able to kind of get over it a little bit by surrounding herself with this, like, you know, it's kind of like fighting fire with fire a little bit. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, but in those the, just those descriptions of like standing in line to go see the bridges of Madison County, you know, all of a sudden there was a little bit of humor there. And then when she remembers a few things about what was going on and she ends that show um, with her mother, uh, who is a staunch Catholic, um, uh, obviously, being asked to pick out the new Jesus um, on the crucifix back at her church and a phone call she's having with her mother who's, you know, it's ensconced back in Spokane. Life is kind of going on and just kind of as a, as a way to kind of put a cap on the story and say, and now we're kind of a little bit back to normal now that Mike is gone. Um, she's talking about her mother with her very flat Spokane accent saying, I found the best Jesus. I call him sports connection, Jesus. And it's just, you know, she got this muscly hot guy to hang on a cross and, and how, you know, Julia's on the phone going, okay, mom. And after you've kind of gotten to know her mom as a character throughout this whole show, it's just kind of, you know, and her dad is addicted to NPR and, you know, but in Letting Go of God, she goes to she she talks about how her, her father passed away right? and how in that moment she almost went back to religion because there was just this. And all of a sudden she looked around and said, I can't, you know, and just the way she tells her stories, there's not often a joke in there, right. but it's her her vantage point. It's her point of view. And I love the fact that she can mix up the sad and the funny and it just, you know, she can make just everyday stuff funny um but letting go of god was the was the moment that i became super fan because there was finally someone talking about religion in a way that mirrored my own life that i could relate to that didn't make me feel like a dick okay well i mean i I like her and i've seen stuff uh, you know some of her stuff there and 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 i knew of her in in snl when she back Uh in the day and uh so i don't put anything past her because she's i think she's a very good artist yeah Again, I, and it sometimes makes me feel like I'm shallow, I'll be honest. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I remember saying at one point, I'm really, really shallow. People need to stop acting like I'm I'm de- depthful and that I care about stuff uh-huh. because I'm, I'm not. I, you know, I like I like when and again, that's I, I'm going into this because that was like really your connection mm-hmm. to. Uh, Julia's is is a little different to my connection to the two uh, comedians that I'm talking about today. Mm-hmm. So Kathleen Madigan is the first one. Uh-huh. Now there were Who several. I really like. There are several that I could have, and, and mm-hmm. another one that I kind of flip flop, but but she's almost kind of in the same genre. Is uh, Jean Garofalo, uh-huh. who back in the day, and I mean like the '90s, '80s, yep. and '90s, whenever she started, I loved her so much. So smart. Um, and I put Kathleen in this. I think Kathy Griffin before the Trump stuff, before the political yeah. stuff. A lot of times we talk about things, and it's pre twenty sixteen. It's the same kind of school yeah. of 
female stand-up comic. Mm-hmm. And Kathy Mannion is oh, probably recovering Irish Catholic, yeah. but definitely is her upbringing. Mm-hmm. She's from Missouri, middle of America. And um, she's really, really good friends with Lewis Black, which to me, that also tells you something. Yeah. Because Lewis Black, very, very smart, uh, but he's very dark. Yeah. He's the anger comic. He is the anger comic. He's angry. And, you know, and they are really good friends. Mm-hmm. And so there's, and, and you see this in Kathleen's comedy. Yep. It's very much anecdotal about her family mm-hmm. and stories and things that happened to her. She will get political a little bit, yep. but not ever hammer over the head. Uh-huh. That's not who she is. Yeah. She talks about being Irish and the whole drinking thing yeah. and the smoking thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for me, it's it's almost like putting on a warm blanket. Yeah. It's kind of like Jim Gaffigan. I'll put it in that as well. And that she's not as clean. Like Jim Gaffigan really doesn't ever cuss or anything like that. His is really pretty much clean yeah. comedy. So it's not like she's like that. Um, she she can get dirty, all that. But she's not blue, blue, no. you know, in comedy. No. But I she... It's a comfortable comedy for me. Uh-huh. And that doesn't mean to say that she doesn't say things that, that are a little uh, sometimes. Yeah. It's just she's not Kathy Griffin. You're never going to see her doing something really about Kim Kardashian. controversial like that. No. <laughs> but she do, you know what? She doesn't do those kind the the celebrity thing. That's yeah. not her gig. Uh-huh. That yeah. is Kathy Griffin pulled that from Joan Rivers. That was their gig, and yeah. they nailed it. That was not Kathleen Madigan. It really was more about... Stuff that happened in her life that she just looks the absurdity yeah, of it. Yeah. But again, um, well, I laughed so hard when she said something about Ferguson. You know, she grew up next to Ferguson, yeah. and you know that is. I mean, it, she goes, she gets political in That's terms of saying. topic matter, but the way that she handled it was just like people say, "Oh my God, can you believe all that happened?" And she's like, "Oh yeah." You know, and, that got, I, and not only she said, "I can't even keep," I can't believe we kept a lid on it for, all for these twenty-five years. years. Yeah, you know. <laughs> And she's just out there with it. And I was like, A, just, I mean, in terms of my own politics, Mm -hmm. that was the right answer for me. Yeah. You know, because otherwise, if she would have said, no, that was a complete shock, I would have been like, then you haven't been paying attention. And she clearly has. She's a, you know. Well, she's also, um, keep in mind, she's a friend of Lewis Black. Yeah. Okay. He's not. And he's very political. Um, So her political sensibilities come through, but you're right. She doesn't hit you over the head with a sledgehammer. That's not who she is. If it's it's one of those, and I like that subtlety that um, she's there. To make you laugh. Uh-huh. She's going to tell you funny stories. Now, if in the end you learn a little bit of where she is or, yeah. you know, because she also mentioned the Civil War, you yeah. know, and, and uh, stuff that we're watching. But I just enjoy her. But she's always been like that. I I, um, mm-hmm. I believe she won Last Comic Standing. I believe that that okay. reality show. I never watched it, but I believe she is one of the winners. In fact, I believe the other comedian I'm going to talk about is also a winner of that. Totally coincidence because Stacy okay. didn't watch that show. Okay. But, you know, so she'll do those competition kind of things every once in a while. But she's been around for quite a bit, yeah. for quite a while. But she, I, again, she re-ups her, her sets. So it's not like it's old stuff. She's sure. not, and you know, she's, just, she's not she's, talking about Bush right and now. And I, I believe she's probably just naturally very funny. I mean, I don't get the sense, and I don't know her, I've never met her. Right. I don't get the sense that she she builds a big persona to walk on stage. I think that's probably her. Yeah. But like last week, you said you'd love to have lunch with Angela Lansbury. Mm-hmm. I would love to have a beer. With I, would totally. I, would <laughs> I would totally. I would totally love to sit at a dark yes. bar and just shoot the yes. shit. You know, she would be hysterical. Yes. And you and she would get along because again, she has that Irish Catholic, that yeah. Catholic upbringing, uh-huh. big time. And this family that is, you know, her parents, that generation that's struggling to deal with all the changes that came with the late 21st century and the late 20th century and the early 21st century. Uh So, you know, and and she's right there on that, uh, not the baby boomers, under the baby boomers, but before the Gen Xers, that kind of weird place. And as I said, I like her because... I almost always, I laugh. Mm -hmm. And and again, that's what she's supposed to do. But again, if I want a different kind of humor, I mean, there are times I've watched Kathy Griffin stuff, uh, Sarah Silverman and that sort of thing. But it's a different mood. Yeah. When I turn on Kathleen Madigan. And, Kathy Madigan and, is and she, beer and pretzels. In yeah, Congress that's form. a really good, that's, <laughs> that's exactly, that's a really good uh, description. And, and. It's just, it's comfortable. It's a good... Yep. Soft pretzels with spicy mustard. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Spicy mustard. Yep. 
uh, and a dark a dark beer. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, as I said, that's so she's she's uh, she's one of my favorites, yeah, and yeah. and I think if you haven't, I would check her out because she is, as I said, it's that subtle. You find things out subtly. But the way she tells a story, too, I just yes. I enjoy she's that Irish Blarney, t- you know, that she's yeah. definitely Irish. Very salt of the earth. And kind of. but she has she'll tell you she'll spin you a yarn and you just sit there. And at the end, you're going, oh, my gosh, that was ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's that's my thing about and her thing. dad. It's also kind of a fun whenever she brings up her dad. Oh, yeah. Oh, come on, Kathleen. Oh, yeah. Well, they yeah. were very they were you talk about, you know, conservative Catholic, mm-hmm. you know, this it's the whole that generation of parent was I'm going to do what my parents did. It mm-hmm. was good enough for me. It's good enough for you. Yeah. School of hard knocks kind of thing. And because she did, we just saw where she said a girl, she was at school to death in the bathroom <laughs> on the floor. third floor, in the bathroom. On yeah. the, uh, they found out that a girl had been a student had been stabbed to death on the third floor bathroom. Again, not a real great setup for a joke. It's not. And it's not funny. Okay, certainly Until not for the Kathleen girl. takes it and says. Well, she tells her dad. She says, <laughs> "Dad, oh my gosh, this girl was stabbed in the third floor bathroom." And, you know, now if if my child came to me, yes. I would be making phone calls. Oh, okay? Sure. Yes. Shit would go down. Well, you wouldn't even have to. There, there would be no, a, there I would be have been a in national line. crisis. Yes. Her father just turns the page on whatever magazine he's reading and says, well, don't go to that bathroom, Kathleen. Don't be an idiot. Use your mind. Use your mind. (laughs) And you're like, you know, but that again, that was that we all sit there and we go, yeah, I know him. Yeah. And that's the thing is that she tells these stories and brings these kids in your life and she describes them well enough to where you're like, I know that Mm -hmm. person. And then you can picture it, and then sure. the story takes on a bit. I, I and just, it's an absurd story, but it's also it's real also at the true. same time because life can be absurd, exactly. and that's what that's what good comics can do. Right, is they can really show you just in the everyday. Because a lot of times, you know, this this old adage is it's funny because it's true. And yes. if somebody has described something that you have experienced or you have been through, but it's ridiculous at the same time. Yeah. Then you're going to laugh because you that's have just to. Real. It's either yeah. laugh or cry. That's yeah. kind of well, where we come down. Exactly. And uh, so anyway, that's that's my the first one I wanted to, I wanted to throw out there for people who haven't discovered her. Kathleen Great. Well, we've got each of us have got one more we're going to discuss, and then we'll do a little bit of final diagnosis. We are here today talking about funny girls. Open wide. It's your prescribed dose of operation with Eric and Stacy. And we're back. This is Poperation. <laughs> I am Aaron. I'm Stacy. And we're talking this week about women who crack us the fuck up, who make us laugh. Mm-hmm. Funny mm-hmm. girls. Mm-hmm. Um, and the next one on my list. You talk been, about her all I love her. the time. I love her. And I'm and just going to say like her name. I'm yeah, going to yeah. do something interesting and just introduce her right Shut off up. the bat. Uh, Margaret Cho. Yeah. And I have to say, I, I've been a fan of Margaret Cho's for a long time. Um, but like, you know, I talked about Julia Sweeney and how she did something and I liked it and she did something else and I really liked it. And then she did something and I loved it. And that's when I became a fan. I became a super fan of Margaret Cho's the very first time I saw her in stand up, And I still think this is her best quote unquote work ever. And it's a special that she did called I'm the one that I want. Are you familiar with it? I don't know what it is. I remember seeing her very early on in her career and she would do her mom. Yes. It was before she got the uh, TV show. Oh, and she would do there was there was I, I was I'm yeah. saying a long time ago, and she would do this bit where she would it was a conversation you would have with her mother, and I remember crying. I was laughing so oh, yeah. hard. No, no, no. She can't. Well, I mean, if it, okay, so if a white comedian did the Asian voice that that Margaret uses for oh, her mother, it would be so offensive, it, awful. But this is, and actually, I've seen Margaret Cho's mother being interviewed, and that's pretty much exactly <laughs> what she sounds like. I mean, Margaret knows what she comes from, so, so it's all right. But I'm the one that I want was a, a stand up special that she did. She went on tour with it, and it was a lot of jokes. You know, they she started off in the the first bit was this whole extended bit about. Carl Lagerfeld in prison. Can you imagine if Carl Lagerfeld went to prison and asking people to smuggle a fan into prison in their ass so he could, because he can't be without his fan. I mean, it was just, you know, there was, she just had her bits. And of course she's playing to the the gay audience, which is always, you know, a big favorite of hers. 
But the the extended piece of I'm the one that I want to kind of reminds me of letting go of God a little bit in that it's funny throughout and it's a little bit more caustic and it's a little bit more stand up. She's just there with a microphone and kind of working with her audience. But it's all about that TV show. And it was about the okay. time in her life okay. when she made she was the first Asian American person to headline a sitcom. Yes. And it was called All American Girl. Yes. And it was about an Asian family. And uh, I remember it. Yeah. I, I remember I try. I mean, I, I watched it when it was on. Was it good? It, here's a problem with it. And, and I don't know whether she talked about that. And in, in uh-huh. this, but the, the thing was that they they sitcomized it. I mean, they made it like every other sitcom. Yeah. They tried to. I don't know. I, I don't know what the word is in that you you take the uniqueness out of it so much okay. that it then is kind of homogenized. Okay. And I think that that was, it also might've been a timing thing. Yeah, maybe. Um, But one of the things that she really addresses head on in this was once she was working for the television studio, they ordered her to lose weight. Sure. And so this is when she developed an eating disorder. Again, great material for comedy. Wouldn't it be? Although it is, and she's so funny. Um, And she talks about the fact that, you know, uh, the absurdity of being asked to lose weight, to play the part of yourself on your own TV show when everyone says, you know, you're supposed to be the star of this huge thing. So it's all about kind of, and then when the show got canceled and she then went into a kind of an eating spiral. And at the end of it, she talks about going into rehab, getting clean, and now she's better. And the whole thing about I'm the one that I want is just like, I'm okay with me. I'm not going to let anyone else tell me you're too fat. You're too this. You're too Asian. You're not Asian enough. All that kind of stuff. But she was a real kind of indictment of the entertainment industry and Again, I make it sound super serious when I discuss it. It is <laughs> so funny. Lots of cameos from her mom, you know, show up in the show. She has conversations with her mother. I think that was the one where she, her mother wanted to know if she was gay. And so she left a, a message on her phone and basically said, if you're gay, you know, if you're not gay, you'll pick up the phone because only gays screen their calls. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, uh, is so excited when nobody picks up and she goes, you're gay. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Um, and of course, I'm not going to do the mom's voice because that would be that would be bad. really bad. That would be bad. Here's here's what I want to say. And, and it, I was thinking about when we're talking about and it goes with the men comics, too. Here's the thing that comedians can do is they can tell these stories that really happened. And when they put it into their acts and, it, and they bring out the funny of it, mm-hmm. they can actually put out information that we would not have known before. Yeah. So they can say things that uh, an actress can't is not going to go on a Good Morning America or, you know, CNN or go on to an interview and say, Mm -hmm. you know, if she wants to keep her job. Yeah, they told me that I had to lose weight. But a comic can go in there and put it in her show and bring out the funny of it. Yeah. And so now we do have that information and we realize that, oh, my gosh, it's not all lollipops and roses there. But, it, you know, she's she's not completely blacklisted. It's almost it's like, give us all your it's like yeah. Kathy Griffin now with this. And this is also you know, 10 years after the fact, you know, she was doing. And I show. get that, too. But I think that just in general, that comics can say things and get information, you know, get, yeah. you know, their experiences out. They can tell about their experiences where a straight actress who isn't a comedian doesn't really have a venue to tell yeah. their experiences. But pr- unless she writes her own movie. And but stars that's usually it, but that's right, right, rare. right. Um, one of the funniest things, and I'm the one that I want, was uh, she it, the story starts off when she's in her trailer on her show and she, you know, her digestive system completely falls apart. And she starts peeing blood. And that's the moment that her boyfriend decides to break up with her. And that also might be the moment people just turned off this podcast. Well, (laughs) (laughs) but she's screaming, I'm being blood, I'm being blood. And the guy's like, "Um, listen, this is not really working out. And we're two different people. And you pee blood, so (laughs) bye. And he leaves. And she ends up in the hospital. They call an ambulance. And she goes to the hospital. And she wakes up to a woman who says, hi, my name's Gwen. I'm here to wash your vagina. And she uses that statement and riffs on it for a good 10 minutes on what it must be like to be Gwen. (laughs) And her, you know, imagination taking over on what Gwen's life must look like. When that's a normal statement. And she repeats the phrase, hi, my name is Gwen. I'm here to wash your vagina about 90 times in the course. 
And it's funnier and funnier and funnier every time she does it. That's one of the things I, I really appreciate about Margaret Cho is her. She's always right there with the audience. She knows exactly how for, she can milk a joke right. like nobody else in the world. And she'll know when to stop when the audience is done with it. But if the audience is still with it, she'll just keep going. And sometimes it gets funnier the more she does it. Well, and what I will say about the three that we've talked about so far, they've all been in the business for a while. Yeah. And they all can they all know that. They all know the timing of going with the audience that you have right now. Mm -hmm. Not what was, is normal and what you're used to or what is probably going to happen, but you listen to the audience that you have now. It's that experience that just makes it every year that they're doing this makes them just that better. That's that much better, that much more funny, mm -hmm. and their timing just that much more on. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Margaret is pretty blue. She can go there. Yeah. Um, a lot. Uh, a lot of audiences don't like her for that. So, you know, if you're if you're if you're looking for a, a nice lady to sit down with your kids and watch some stand up, Margaret Cho might not be your first yeah, you might want to go to that chick who spoke two different languages. That way, if she's <laughs> offensive, you don't know. I didn't know whether I was offended or not. But, uh, but you know, in in and Margaret now has a. She's really well known for all of her tattoos. She's just a, yeah. she's a tattooed lady these days. She's got you know tattoos everywhere. She loves them. Okay, fine. You know, uh, she did a show, the Notorious CHO, mm -hmm. kind of a riff on the Notorious B.I.G. Um, after she did I'm the one that I want and really kind of went there sexually and talked about, you know, experimenting with kink and bondage and just, you know, and her just, you know, unzipping the mask to say something at one point it was one of the funniest sight gags I ever saw. And of course, she's just standing there with a the microphone. You right. Know? Um, so she's really, really great. And also that whole beaver fever right. you know, bit that we looked at was from the notorious CHO yeah. um, talking about porn and masturbation and lots of I mean, she goes there. She's decided that especially I think as an Asian woman. This idea that not only women are supposed to be submissive, but if you're in the world of stereotypes, Asian women are supposed to be oh, yeah. the most submissive women on the planet. And she is not. Right. She is just she is bold. She's audacious. She's out there. Um, I'm the one that I want has a soundtrack by Joan Jett. Like that's how <laughs> she opens and closes her show. Um, and it's just, you know, she's she's great. I you know, she's she's very bold. She's very much a diva. Um, and uh, she says things that are shocking. And it's hard to shock me. You know, quite quite often, and uh, she can usually do it. And typically, I just respond by giggling. Well, there you go. There's me... that risk I was talking about yeah. earlier. And um, but I think more and more that's that's happening. I think more, and maybe it's because it's harder and harder to shock people. Yeah. So comics have to go further and further. And even female comics have to. And I, I said something about Sarah Silverman mm -hmm. earlier. Yep. And I think, you know, that's the next generation, although she's been around quite a while. But you have Amy Schumer, who is, you know, now, you know, she was stand up and, and was new. And then, you know, once she's you know, moving into movies and, and that sort of thing, uh, of course, she had her TV show, which is yep. brilliant. Yes. But I think that it is, they are, you talk about you know, working blue, as, mm -hmm. as they say, uh, you know, they're, they're still pushing that limit. And, and one of the ones, the last one that I want to talk to talk about is, is she's fairly new. She's like right there right now. And her name is Elisa Schlesinger. And I, um, the, there are three uh, of her shows on Netflix right now, if you want to watch them. Mm -hmm. I would watch them in chron chron chronological order, I think, just because she has evolved. They get better and better. They get better. The If you go backwards, you won't like the first one as much. <laughs> um, because it's not just her skill as a, as a comic, uh -huh. but her material. She's better a better writer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. Comics typically, you know, you, you judge them usually on their performance, but they also, almost all of them, write everything that they perform. Right. Right. They write and, their own stuff. And it's not only just her writing, but also deciding who is my skin. You're talking about Margaret and, well, all the ones that we've talked about. Uh -huh. I don't know. Kathleen Manigan may, may have had her known who she was from the get-go. I don't know. I've always, she's always kind of been the same. Sure. Whereas Julia has kind of changed, evolved, mm -hmm. if you will. And Margaret Cho certainly has. Yeah. You look at her first stuff and you look at her stuff now. Very different. Yes. Kathy Griffin is the same. Very different from what she was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. She was, you know, back in the day, curly headed, cute, perky. And we're going to talk about celebrities yeah. to where she is now. 
and and so that's kind of what I see in Eliza's stuff. Mm-hmm. I really liked her last one, Confirmed Kills is okay. the newest one, and I I really enjoyed <laughs> it. Pleasant, I know. Well, <laughs> and but and you kind of have to see the other ones to to get that one because she she has gigs as well as her dog uh-huh. Blanche that she brings into every show. So you should love it. She has her she dog, has a Blanche. dog named Blanche. Yeah. I yeah. love her already. adopted dog named Blanche. It's adorable. Um, she actually was on. Do you ever watch Hollywood Game Night with Jane Lynch? Yes. She was on there like last week she? or the week before. Okay. And uh, yeah, she's really smart and really sharp. She's one of the ones that in the think end. You have to be to do stand up. Oh, you have. Can no, you be stupid and do stand up? I don't think you can. Think well, part of it comes to, I was talking about the heckling thing, is you've got to be able to have comebacks for people. Yep. And uh, but my point on this was she was on Hollywood Game Night, and and she is one of the ones that if you're going to go for the twenty five thousand at the end, you want to pick her. She knows her stuff. But she brought her dog on there too. Aww. She takes Blanche everywhere. Blanche. Anyway, what kind of dog is Blanche? It's uh, it's a kind of mutt. It's a oh, little tiny little better. mutt thing. Oh my god! Yeah, it's adopted. A mutt yeah, named Blanche. Yeah, she's but she, as I said, she is extremely smart. I feel like now she's really in ownership of who. I say character, but it's like owning who she is as uh-huh. opposed to trying to find out who am I kind of thing, okay. which is what I kind of saw in the first ones. But she considers herself a millennial. Okay. And well, I hate to tell you, millennials turned 41 this year. Do they really? Yes. I mean, the oldest okay, millennials she, are in their 40s. Well, how, how are the youngest millennials? Maybe it's semantics. I don't know. What are the youngest millennials? I then? think they're, I mean, they're, well, the, the next generation is about to graduate from high school. Okay, because she's so, like 32-ish. She's like okay. in her early 30s she's a millennial. or something. She's so, totally a millennial. Okay, I just need to learn that. what that means. Anyway. Millennial used to mean young kid, and that they're just getting older like everybody else. That's the oh. problem. So, well, she's very much claimed that, and she that is her, that's how she thinks. Okay. Okay? So the old school stuff, the old school style, um, how things used to be done, that's not where she is. She mm-hmm. doesn't accept that. She can be profane, okay? Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, you're not going to take your little kid to see her, okay? Because okay. she'll she talks about all sorts of subject matter. And again, kind of in the vein of Sarah Silverman, Amy Schumer, no holds bar. She'll yep. just say whatever the hell. Good. Um, Love that. But she also, but again, she's able to bring the funny out. And I see her, I will, you know, I really love Sarah Silverman, but here's what I'm going to say. Sometimes... She's really on the mark, and I love it. And laugh, but some, but it's like it's either feast or famine with her, in my opinion. <laughs> if she's not that hysterical, I'm rolling on the floor laughing. Mm-hmm. She's awful, in my opinion. I'm, I'm not laughing at anything. Huh. Okay. Whereas Eliza, it's not that she's always hysterical, but I'm always, I'm always there. I mean, if, I'm chuckling. It. I'm chuckling most of the time. Okay. And the worst that happens is I'm just smiling. Okay, it's the worst that happens. As opposed to that woman who didn't speak my language and went back and forth, <laughs> I just got mad. <laughs> um, but I don't know. Uh, but uh, but but I as she's as I said, she's really really yeah, maybe smart. Maybe if you were bilingual, you would have liked that show. I don't really think more. I would have because I didn't like her. She wasn't personable. Well, okay. Wait, you know we're going to leave that alone. I'm just saying <laughs> you need to be careful, and not all comics are equal. Okay. Um, oh, granted. Got that. <laughs> Got that. I'm just like, if I don't understand the joke, like, you know, if I watched a stand-up comic in French, I'd be like, oh, maybe they're funny. I don't know. Yeah. Now, another one that is kind of like Eliza that I also like, who's kind of new, and it's a millennial, too, mm-hmm. is Jenny Slate. Okay. Now, Jenny Slate is, of course, doing really well doing voiceovers for animated features, by the way. Yeah. She's all over the place, and she's got this cute little voice. But I also saw a movie she was in, but I wasn't going to get into Jenny Slate. But I like Land her. Landline, was that the movie? No. Okay. It was the other one where she's pregnant. She finds mm. out she's pregnant. Okay. It's a weird name. I'll, I'll think of it some other time. But anyway, Eliza's in that same vein. It's yep. this young woman who is grateful to Phyllis and Joan and Kathy and all of those who've you know gone before. Paved the way. Paved the way. Thank you. Um, and, you know, now, but we're going to go in this direction kind of way. And and I, it's not always the direction that Stacy would necessarily go, but I appreciate that because uh-huh. that's what I want. I want, you know, she's not, she's, she's too old to be my daughter, but I do want, that's the kind of personality that these 
younger comedians are doing is I want the, you know, that's the kind of attitude I want my daughters to have is that I'm just going to go. I'm, I want to be fearless. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. Fearless. But she's funny. Again, yeah. the point is you got to be funny. I don't give a crap about anything else yeah. if you're not funny. But I, I think you have to be fearless to even get up there to a certain extent. I yes. mean, you know, the fearlessness yes. doesn't always come through if the if the content's not great. It doesn't make you laugh. Right. But that's, that's my whole thing about stand-up from the very beginning, which is why the two of us always give people these blank stares and say, oh, you should do stand-up. You're so funny. Yeah. It's like, no, no. 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 But as I was just talking about that, I kind of what, what what hit me was if someone else would write all my stuff, and all I had to do is memorize it. And I could take it on like a roll. I would do stand up. Yeah. Would you, I, you even know. with a heckler issue? Eh, that, yeah. That I'm a little be my concer- favorite. I'm a little concerned about hecklers. That would be honest, my favorite. I am, yeah. I'm not quick thinking on my feet like that. That would not be my favorite part of the job. But well, I'm sure what you do is you just, you know, you, you store up all of your material. So if they give you this kind of heckling, you just kind of spit back with this. And you've got some insults kind of at the ready. And your mother. Yeah. That would be me. Yeah. That would be all I got. And your mother. <laughs> that's what your mom said. I don't even know. I don't even know where I go. See, I'm not good at it at all. Okay. Uh, Stacy's not doing stand-up ever. Speaking of people yes. who might not need to be in stand-up. Yes. Shaquille O'Neal. What? So, I, we were talking earlier about how Netflix has... The stand-ups, uh-huh. which is a, is a show, and it has it's half hour bits. highlighting yeah. about six about six or seven per season, uh, but a little half right. hour for each one. Yep. And um, Fortune Feimster was I one of she them. Was funny, yes, she was. And so, and I also mentioned that Brad Paisley had a special, a special where he also had like four or five. And comics. he was the MC. He was the MC. He came funny. on, but funny. Okay. Apparently, and I haven't seen this one. Shaquille O'Neal has one as well. Okay. Is he the MC? Well, it's it's the Shaquille O'Neal something, stand-up, what a carnival. I don't even know what it's called, but I'm it's scared. Shaquille. Okay. And I don't remember who's in it, right. but I just kind of went, is that a thing now? Is that what we're doing? Is that mm-hmm. anybody can just say, I'm going to get a bunch of comedians, and then I'm going to go up too, and we're going to call it my show. Uh, I'm just okay. throwing that out there. Hey, if it the was comics are good and he's not, you know. And they may be. I didn't see that show. And Brad's were eh, some good, some not so good. I mean, Brad was funnier than several of them. So oh, that's a problem. Well, mm, okay. That's a problem. That is a problem. The stand-ups on Netflix, I really enjoyed. Yes. There were like, you know, these these six little bits. They were each a half an hour based on one comic. One of the guys just stood up there and said, um, I've got this list of jokes. Let me try them out for you. <laughs> that was his unifying theme. So it went all over the place. And some Ba-boop. of them you're going to recognize. Some of those, uh-huh. they're not necessarily new. Yep. They're just they're just put together in this, the, you know, they gave him 30 but minutes. Netflix is like, these are people who might not yeah. be household names, but deserve but, a little bit of your attention. Exactly. So here's a half an hour. And if you like them, yeah. there you go. Um, and as I said, you know, but it looks like there's several of those little compilations of, of things. So, but again, I think I get a lot of standups uh, recommended to me by Netflix because I watch a lot of stand up yes. on Netflix because I travel on airplanes a lot. And it's a pretty safe bet that all you're going to look you're at right. visually is someone with a microphone. Here's the deal. So what did we learn today? Our final diagnosis around funny girls is part you know, one. I, you got to keep saying part okay, one. Funny girls part one. Fine. To me, I, you know, it, splitting these comics up by gender didn't really, you know, inform me a whole lot about the gender split so much. Only that storytelling thing is is very clear for women that they I, I feel like they do that more so than the guys do. Yes, I agree. Um, you know, but other than that, you know, stand up is the same kind of thing. Stand up is hard. Stand up takes guts. And, um, you know, and you have to be genuine and I think you have to be really smart. You have to be a good writer. Um, you have to have a huge ego and very little ego. at the same. It has to be a huge ego, but a strong ego think, able to withstand a lot. I really admire people who do it. I think that the deal is, yes, I think there is that fearless quality that we talked about with men too. There is, there is, you have to be able to have the guts to go up there and put yourself, make yourself vulnerable like that. I think that you're right. I think there is a storytelling that is a little different, but aside from that, it is about your personality. You do have to have all these things, good writer and good presence and all that, but you also need to be able to connect with the audience. And the ones that we've talked about today 
are. They're able to connect to their audience. And that's, mm-hmm. I think, if you're successful, that you are able to. Yeah. I also think, you know, the reason that we talked about these is if you haven't ever seen them or you've seen a little bit or it was a long time ago or whatever, these are maybe some that you might check out just for giggles. Because, yeah. as I said, in every day and age, but certainly we feel it right now in this day and age, there has to be time when you can step outside of what is reality and have a little bit of a laugh. Yeah. And I think that the four that we talked about today, and again, I think we'll probably revisit this because sure. we have so many that we even just referred to today that I would love to, to delve in and talk a little bit more yeah. about those. Yeah. Uh, we'll touch on it I again. I listen to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me every week. Paula Poundstone makes me want to pee. Oh, my we hands. hadn't talked about her yet. Yeah. So funny. No, she's very. Yeah. Talk about smart. And that is it. I think smart is a thing. I think smart is really up there yeah. with things that you need to have. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so anyway, that's, that's who these are. But I do think, I think that there is a comic for every taste about every subject and clearly in every language. <laughs> Boy, okay. And, uh, but, but, you know, I, I think that it's, it's a really good time. I will do that when I, again, you talked about, you've told a story about, you know, flying on an airplane. There are times when you have, you know, this time, what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. You can't really, you don't have enough time for a movie yeah. or necessarily even an hour long something or other. But you put on some jokes, you put on that kind of takes you out of that moment, makes you feel a little better, lightens yeah. your load a little bit. And uh, ain't nothing wrong with that. You know, and, and that person who you want to have a beer with that we kind of talked about in yes. terms of Kathy Madigan, mm-hmm. that's what half the people in comedy clubs are doing. That's you are exactly. that person. Yeah. I'm drinking a beer and you're talking to me and yep. I'm just laughing at what you're saying, and it's a very one-sided conversation, but it's conversational because there's no one on stage for yep. the stand-up person to talk to. They're just talking to you, and they're saying, hey, this is who I am. Yep. And so being that kind of person who can connect yep. uh, is all of, all of the above. Um, the, so. the ones that we talked about today, plus a, a, a really long list yep. of folks we didn't get to, um, it's an art form that, again, I, I just admire so much. Yep. Um, this is Poperation. I'm Eric. I'm Stacy. And next week we'll be talking about something fun. In the meantime, look for us wherever you find podcasts. Tell your friends about us. Rate and review us wherever you find the opportunity to do that. www.poperationroom.com. See you in the next time. You've been listening to Poperation with Eric and Stacy. Check out our website at poperationroom.com for links to our blog and other extras. Don't forget to subscribe to Poperation via iTunes, iHeartRadio. Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, and other podcast locations. You can also follow at Poperation Room on Facebook and Twitter. Music provided by purpleplanet.com. <laughs>